purpose of this video is to look at how a discounted cash flow model can help us better understand some of the changes in stock valuations for situations such as COVID-19. Now, I do want to add as a little disclaimer, this is not specific to COVID-19. You can use this to look at things like the financial crisis that hit 2008, 2009, or any other event that you want to do. The key factor is that you're going to be looking at how inputs into the model translate into changes in valuation. And because we are in the midst of the current global COVID-19 pandemic, and that's been unfolding internationally. I'm recording this on March 25th, 2020. So it's been going on for about three months at this point. It has started to spread from China across the globe. And so pretty much the entire world is seeing some impacts right now due to COVID-19. Again, I want to stress, this is not a COVID-19 video. Instead, it's just a way to look at what's been happening to stock prices and to explain that from a financial perspective and how this makes sense. So we're going to start with a discounted cash flow model. A discounted cash flow model, and this is effectively a free cash flow to equity model. Free cash flow to equity just says that the value of the firm or the value of the stock for the firm is equal to the present value of all the expected free cash flows that the company is going to generate for stockholders discounted back to today at the cost of equity. So here you can see I've got that in a mathematical formula. Effectively, the value is equal to the expected free cash flow to equity in year one discounted back one year plus the expected free cash flow to equity in year two, discounted back two years, all the way out through infinity. Now, one of the complications of finance is that if we look at this E, that means expected. What is the free cash flow to equity going to be for a specific company next year, two years from now, three years from now? Nobody knows, so these are our best guess. We have to recognize there's going to be a lot of error into that. What is the appropriate discount rate? Again, that's a judgment call. It's subjective. Nobody knows exactly what that should be. And remember, we're not guessing just the next two to three years. We're guessing out through infinity. So an important disclaimer that I want to stress, this is not an exact science. We're not saying that when we do this valuation, the stock price should be $52.33 or anything precisely like that. Now, the Excel model is going to spit out a value that gives us a precise value to the penny. But it's important that we recognize these are rough estimates. They're not designed to give us exact values. They're designed to help us get approximations of what stock prices are worth. So what we're going to need to do is forecast our cash flows out as far as we reasonably can. Now you can argue about what that is and there's some legitimate concerns about our ability to forecast. Once we've hit a level where we say, you know what, our, our extra inputs are no longer adding any value. We want to find a terminal cash flow and then we're going to solve for the present value. I've got a spreadsheet that we're going to look at that's going to help us do some of this. It's important to note that a lot of assumptions go into this. It's not a case of, oh, we're going to grow at 8.6% in year three. Uh, we don't know exactly how fast we're going to grow over the next year, let alone over the next several years through infinity. So lots of estimates. We have to recognize that it's an approximation. It's not going to be, here is the value. On the plus side, because we've set up a model in Excel, you can easily adjust inputs to see a reasonable range of values, and you can tweak these. So if you say, well, what happens if sales grow a little bit more slowly, or what happens if our discount rate is a little higher or a little lower? You can change those very quickly. What if our margins are a little higher or lower? You can easily adjust those and do a lot of sensitivity analysis. So with that said, let's go to the spreadsheet. So here's a spreadsheet that I put up 
And just as a little side note, these are just some numbers that I plugged in. It's not anything, it's not a specific company or anything like that. So we start out with our 2019 sales. Now, this is 2020 right now. So we're going to project our 2020 sales. We're only partway into 2020. And we don't know what those sales are going to be. So we're going to have a growth rate here that we're estimating. And I just started with 8%. This is our property, plant, and equipment. We're going to use that for depreciation. This is a free cash flow to equity. Depreciation is not a cash expense, so it's going to lower our net income, but it doesn't lower our free cash flows. So we're going to want to add back in our depreciation. All these things in yellow here are our inputs. Now, I want to add one other disclaimer. This is a general model, so it's far more specific than, for example, the constant growth model, but it's not as specific as you would probably apply if you were looking at an actual company. If you were looking at an actual company, you would break down their income statement with the line items that they've been using and try to make that as precise as possible. So this is more of a general model that can be applied to multiple companies with some approximations, as I've mentioned before. So we're gonna start with our increase in sales. And what I've did, done is just kind of set this up as generic company. We were gonna forecast 8% sales for the next couple years, 8% sales growth for the next couple years, then 7%, then 5%, then 4%, 3.5%, and ultimately we're gonna hit 3% and that 3% growth rate is going to stay forever. Now it's important to note when you're doing a model like this where we're, it's called the non-constant model, we're forecasting out individual growth rates for a number of years, ultimately you need to hit a terminal value. You can't forecast cash flow in year 2,738,226. You never get done at that point. So effectively, you're gonna to wanna to go out maybe four, five, six, seven years, however far you feel comfortable forecasting out. And at some point, you're gonna assume a constant growth rate. That constant growth rate should probably be something relatively low, maybe two to 3%. Now, I'm using a constant growth model in 2026 to get my terminal value. If you were dealing with a company that's growing rapidly and you expect them to grow rapidly, maybe not for the next five years, but for the next 15 years, you might want to use something like the H model. The H model allows you to adjust growth rates to decline to a constant growth rate over X number of years. And that can help you deal with companies that are going to be growing faster, not for just four or five years, but maybe growing faster for the next 15 years. Ultimately though, a company can't grow faster than the economy forever. It's just mathematically impossible. So growth rates should be relatively low as far as your terminal cash flow. You don't want to see six, seven, eight percent there. It's not realistic. You might say, well, six, seven percent, that doesn't seem that high. But if the economy grows at two to three percent and your company grows at six percent, at some point, your company is going to take over the entire global economy, and then to keep growing at 6%, it's going to have to, what, cultivate Mars, Jupiter? There's limits to growth, and so eventually, we want the growth rate to slow down some. These numbers are going to vary dramatically based on the company that you're putting in. So, again, this is just a generic model. What we're going to do though is play with these numbers later to see how they change and how prices change. Cost of goods sold as a percentage of sales. So there's two major expense categories. And again, this is where I would fine tune it if I was dealing with an actual company. But we're looking at cost of goods sold, sales general, and administrative expenses. Those are the two major categories. Now within cost of goods sold, you could break that down into separate areas. Sales general, administrative, you could break that down. We're just looking at broad categories. And this company is basically spending about 80% of its revenues on cost of goods sold and sales general and administrative expenses. I forecast those to be constant over the next several years. Again, 
that does not have to be constant. That's the beauty of a spreadsheet. We can play around with these numbers. Depreciation and amortization is a percentage of property, plant, and equipment. What I've done here is allow that to slowly decline. And the idea here is maybe this is a company that's been expanding rapidly, but they're going to start slowing down their expansion. And so they're probably going to have less depreciation over time of their property, plant, and equipment. Again, these numbers are not really relevant right now. Instead, they're just numbers that we're putting in and then we can play around with them later. Capital expenditures. How much is your company spending? Now note here, I didn't actually plug in a fixed number. What I did is said that this company is going to spend about 2% of its sales. Now down here, I've got their sales for 2020. If they're spending 2% of that, the formula is B21 times one times 0 0.02. So I just take their sales times 0 0.02 and I do that across the board. If your company spends four or 5% on capital expenditures, you can take the sales times 0 0.05. Some companies, it's going to be less predictable. They might spend a lot on capital expenditures in one year, slow down the next. Again, that's all based on the assumptions of the company that you're following increase in non-cash working capital. The idea is things here like inventory, accounts receivable, those are likely to go up when sales go up. And so if sales go up, we're going to see an increase in our non-cash working capital, which means that's extra money we need to finance. We need to purchase more inventory. We need to have more money outstanding in accounts receivable so that can lower our free cash flows. So what I've done here is take the change in sales, B21 minus B4, and multiply it by 9%. Why 9%? It was just the number that I selected and said that the non-cash working capital was about 9% of sales. You can look at historical data to get a reference point on there. Now, one thing to be careful about this is going to fluctuate dramatically from year to year. One year it might be 9%, another year it might be 12%, another year it might be 7%. So you don't want to just say, what is it last year? But you want to kind of take a look at what has it been over the last couple of years? And is there a trend going on or a reason we expect it to change going forward? Interest expense. Here I just plugged in numbers but you could very easily take this as a percentage of debt. So kind of figure out what the company is paying on interest on its debt. How much debt do they have outstanding? If the company has $100 million of debt outstanding and the current interest rate on their debt is about 5%, then they're going to have about $5 million in interest expense. So that would be another way to calculate this, or you could just do it as a straight number. Estimated tax rate. Uh, this is going to change quite a bit depending on tax codes. Different countries are going to have different tax rates. International companies are going to have different tax rates. Lots of different things to think about here. One place you can get this information for maybe the next year in advance is if you listen to a company's conference calls, they can give you some ideas sometimes about what the tax rate is going to be. As a side note, that's also a place to get some information about what they think capital expenditures are going to be. Those two numbers are often, not always, but often cited in conference call transcripts. So be sure to look at conference calls if you're doing this valuation analysis. Mentioned before, our constant growth in free cash flows. Here's our risk-free rate. I normally use the 10-year treasury to determine the risk-free rate. Now, I plugged this in a while ago at 2% because I want to say, hey, what's happened in the last month, how have things changed, and that's going to be something that we're going to change going forward. Beta, we're using the security market line to get the required return. I'd caution you about that. There are some concerns, some valid concerns about the security market line as a discount rate. It is commonly used, but take it with a grain of salt. If you end up with a required return of 3%, I would adjust that up. 
If you end up with a required return of 25%, which you're probably not going to get with the security market line, I'd adjust it down. But if your number doesn't seem reasonable, and reasonable is probably going to be somewhere between 6 to 12%, then I would adjust it. And also, reasonable is going to depend on the company. If you're looking at a company that doesn't have much risk, it's probably going to be lower in the 6 to 9% range. If you're looking at a company that's very volatile, it's probably going to be higher, maybe in the 9 to 10 to 11% range. Um, it's going to vary based on market conditions. Right now, as I mentioned, we're in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's probably going to be a little higher for most stocks. Jump back a couple months ago, and it was relatively low for most stocks. So we want to keep in mind the security market line is going to give us an approximation. The market risk premium is a component of that. That's the difference between the expected return on the market and the risk-free rate. The idea is stocks are riskier than bonds. Therefore, we need some extra compensation to benefit us for investing in stocks. I should also note, I said stocks are riskier than bonds, which is true. But here we're looking at relative to the risk-free rate, which theoretically there is a risk-free rate. In practice, there is not. Um, I mentioned I use 10-year treasury notes. They're not truly risk-free, but the idea is what is the return on the market expected to be relative to the 10-year treasury note or whatever you're using for a risk-free rate. And then that's going to give us the required return. Note this is a formula here that's plugged in. That's why it's not yellow. It's going to do that calculation for us. All these values are calculations that the spreadsheet takes care of that ultimately is going to give us our free cash flow. And our free cash flow is our income plus depreciation and amortization minus our capital expenditures and our increase in non-cash working capital. So what is our income? Add back in depreciation and amortization. Take out any increase in non-cash working capital. Take out our capital expenditures. That's how much is available for our shareholders. Now, there are some various definitions of exactly how to calculate free cash flow to equity. Don't worry about, well, as my textbook shows something slightly different because, as I said, all of these are approximations. So as long as you're getting the basic idea, remember income is generated through GAAP and we're not doing the exact income measure. So there's going to be several errors in this. We're not saying our free cash flow is going to be exactly 285.9 million. We're saying that's a reasonable estimate. It's probably not going to be 285 billion. It's probably not going to be 2 million. It's probably going to be somewhere around 250 to 300 million. There's error in here, and I want, can't stress that enough. These are going to be very precise but not accurate numbers. So then here we calculate the present value of the free cash flows out to G. So this is our year one cash flow, year two cash flow, year three cash flow, year four cash flow, year five cash flow, and year six cash flow. The net present value of those is calculated, discounted back at that 7.85% required return that we estimated. And that tells us that the value of these cash flows is about $1.5 billion. But that's not all the cash flows. Because remember, we still have our cash flows in year 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and so on. So we have to find those. So here you can see this formula is the rate. This is my discount rate from the security market line. Six is the number of years we're discounting back. There is no annuity stream, so that's a zero for the payment. And then what we're doing here is we're taking the year seven cash flow divided by the required return minus the constant growth rate. That's giving us our terminal value, and we're discounting that back six years. So when we do that, we get a little over $5 billion. Add those two up, 
We're at about $6.7, $6.8 billion in value for the company. There are 150 million shares outstanding. So if we take the net intrinsic value divided by the number of shares outstanding, that gives us a value per share of $45.16. Now, note that does not mean the stock is worth exactly $45.16. As I mentioned, probably want to think of that as, well, it's probably worth somewhere between 40 to 50. Even that's probably too narrow of a range. I can tell from this that I shouldn't be paying $200 from the stock. I can tell from this that at $5, it's either too cheap or I screwed up on my assumptions, but it gives us kind of a baseline for what the stock is worth. Now, some people also say, well, cash is not really something that the company needs. So if you buy the company, you can take the cash out of there. Let's add that back in. I'm not a fan of doing that because in my opinion, if the company didn't need the cash, they wouldn't be holding it. And so I tend to think of the cash that the firm has as something that it does need. It's part of their operating um, working capital. And so I want to keep that in. I would focus more on this value as what the stock is worth. But sometimes you'll see people say, well, let's add the cash back in. So this is what our company is worth before adjustments. Now we're going to get back to kind of the main point of this video. What happens with some changes? Oops, COVID-19, that's going to kill our sales. I've seen some forecasts that GDP in the U.S. could drop by 14%. Some companies are going to get hit worse than that. For example, what if you're running a movie theater and you're closed for business? Or what if you're running a restaurant, you've had to close your dining room, you're only doing takeout? those companies are gonna get hit pretty hard. On the other hand, if you're Amazon, it's probably not affecting your sales that much. If anything, your sales might be going up as people are less likely to go to the grocery store. So we have to think, how is our company going to get impacted? And I'm just gonna make up a number. Let's say our sales are going to drop by 15% this year. Our costs of goods sold, eh, they're probably going to stay about the same, but our sales general and administrative, they're probably going to go up a little bit because our sales are going to go down. These are percentage of sales, but we might not be able to cut some of our costs as well. So I'm going to crank that up to 30%. Now we might cut back our capital expenditures a little bit, but we want to kind of keep the company going long term. So maybe I'm going to drop that to 20 here and then allow it to kind of resume its normal growth going forward next year. Our tax rate, tax rate is based on income. That might come down a little bit. Let me change that to 18%. Constant growth and free cash flows beyond 2026. That shouldn't be affected at all by what's happening today, right? Because we're talking about six years out in the future. That's not going to be reflect or impacted by what's going on today. Now the risk-free rate, 10-year treasury has dropped. It's probably down around 0.8%. I'll admit I haven't looked today, so that could be a little bit off, but that gives us a ballpark. The beta for the company shouldn't be changing based on this. The company shouldn't be more sensitive to economic conditions or less sensitive to economic conditions. So market risk should be the same but the market risk premium has probably gone up quite a bit. Maybe instead of 4.5%, that could be right around 7% now. So our required return has gone up. Now, next year's growth might actually be a little bit higher. And the reason for that is if sales get killed this year, we're starting from a lower base. So maybe growth jumps to 12%. Sales general and administrative probably starts to drop back down, but maybe not entirely. So we make that adjustment. Capital expenditures, hopefully a year from now, things are back to normal. And so we're going to continue with those. Everything else is going to stay the same. And we're going to leave stuff here, kind of go on out like it is. Now notice under those conditions, the stock price is now worth $25.29. If 
you remember before, it was worth about $45. There was some change on there, but that's a reasonable approximation. So what this is saying is that based on this one bad year, we should expect this stock to drop in value by about 43%. Now that's again based on those assumptions that I made. However, some things to keep in mind. I jumped that market risk premium up quite a bit and it probably is higher now, but we're discounting not just the current cash flow, but all these future cash flows by that amount. So maybe 7% was a little high, maybe 6% would be more reasonable. Or what I could even do is discount the first couple of cash flows back at a higher rate, but then drop some of these later cash flows at a lower rate. That would be another alternative to take care of this. Now, if I jump that to 6% instead of 7%, you can see now we're looking at a 30% decline. Again, different companies are gonna get hit differently. What if my company actually is Walmart or Amazon, like I said, and their sales are doing fine? They're probably going to see an increase in sales, maybe even bigger than normal this year. Let's say that's going to be 10%. Now, their sales general administrative costs probably still going to be a little bit higher, and that's because they're probably going to have to hire some new people. They might have to give some raises to people to get them to come into work under this kind of environment. If you're putting your health at risk in order to go be a cashier, all of a sudden, maybe you need a little bit higher salary. So these things might stay a little bit higher and maybe cost of goods sold is a little bit higher. Bump that up to 57% on that. So sales growth is going up, but maybe our costs are going up as well. Given that, we see a 10.3% drop. So what you're seeing is that different price, different stocks are gonna get impacted differently depending on the assumptions that we build into the model. The beauty about doing this in a spreadsheet is I can go through and tweak any of these assumptions and it's going to spit out new results for me. So it's very easy for me to update this based on what's happening. So that gives you a quick overview of a little more complex way to look at stock valuation. I guess it's not really a quick overview. This video ended up being about 30 minutes, but I think it's a fairly effective idea of looking at what's going on in the economy and how that's translating into stock prices. Now, one thing I should just add is over the last day or two, we've seen a major stimulus package passed in the US, putting another $2 trillion in government spending into the economy. That's probably a big reason why we've seen stock prices jump up dramatically in the last two days. People are changing some of their assumptions again. And so what this is doing is it's providing us a way to evaluate what do we think about the company and the economy versus what's going on in the markets and get a better understanding of that. Hopefully this has been helpful and I'm gonna wrap up here. Thank you.